It's always a bit daunting to hear yourself introduced. <laughs> well, it is a joy to be back here in the Diocese of Toronto, a place that certainly formed and shaped me in so many ways, certainly in ministry and uh, as a bishop, and uh, is certainly part of my ministry today, so it's good to be here. Recent statistics for the church were splashed across the headlines. They were hardly a surprise to anyone who has been in ministry over the past 20 or 30 years. It had begun decades ago. I've actually heard it said that the decline began with the end of World War I <laughs> and the church's collusion with the draft that left families, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families, devastated by the loss of their sons. Others can point to the end of World War II and the moral disillusionment of the Holocaust. Or maybe to the God is Dead movement of the 1960s. Sexual abuse scandals in residential schools began to be aware, we began to be aware of those in the 70s and 80s and onwards. And so there are any number of starting points for the decline of the church, for it is a flawed institution because it's made up of us, human beings who fail as well as succeed. I recall the deep depression of clericus meetings in the late 1990s when clergy knew that there was a serious problem. We could all see the decline in our congregations, but I'd have to say, I'm sure it's not like this now, clergy culture was still one of a certain competitiveness where comparing Easter and Christmas attendance numbers was still practiced. In fact, I remember a parish that will be unnamed, where upon looking at the books and then counting every pew, every extra seat, every seat in the choir, I said, you cannot put that many people in here. <laughs> the cleric who was known for his uh, generosity in counting. <laughs> but we also did not share our unease with each other, even as we felt the blame from parishioners who, in their discomfort at the decline, they also could see, looked for a reason and found it in blaming clergy. We just need better preaching, more visiting, better youth programs, better music. And of course, the clergy replied in kind, we just need more commitment from the laity, regular attendance, engagement in Bible study, more outreach, more Sunday school teachers. We all looked for technical fixes for an upheaval that is far more than a technical problem to be solved. And the atmosphere was rife with grief, our own grief and that of the congregations we served, although it was never or rarely spoken aloud at that time. Where do we look when the future is not yet clear? Past stability has slipped away. Financial security is questioned for church and clergy. What stories, what images, what people give us hope? There were voices that captured our angst and gave us some new language. I think Phyllis Tickle's book, The Great Emergence, was one of those iconic moments where people said, yes, something is bigger, stronger than what we are seeing. The concept she quoted of the great rummage sale in which we're having to decide what to let go of and what to hold on to. Or people like Brian McLaren, his generous orthodoxy, 
a new kind of Christianity or the great spiritual migration. They began to show us images and possibilities for reframing our condition, a process in which we are still engaged. But before the analysts, the philosophers, the sociologists, and pundits, we are a people of faith. And therefore are also a people of hope. We believe that this is God's world, shaped by the love of God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, and the promise, and Peter's already quoted you, my favorite verse, <laughs> that even death is not stronger than that love. We believe God's desire is for relationship with us that invites us into a way of being now, no matter what is happening around us. A way of being that gives life in the darkest times. Now for some time, as I've thought about our current experience, I've thought about it as being a little bit similar to the Exodus. A wandering in the wilderness, looking fondly back at a time of security, although our time of security was not exactly oppression, as we were, and frankly are, mostly part of the dominant forces in our culture and society, part of the colonial forces. But now we are wandering, seeking a new promised land as the security of the comfortable pew has disappeared. Those large Sunday school classes have long gone. I found myself rethinking that image as I stood on Mount Nebo recently at the primates meeting in Jordan. A group of the primates traveled to Mount Nebo and stood in the place where Moses would have stood surveying the promised land at the end of the 40 years of wilderness wandering, knowing that he would not descend into it. In the last chapters of Deuteronomy, we hear Moses speaking to the people and offering his final words of commendation to them. At that location now is a church on a site where people have come on pilgrimage for centuries. They have discovered several baptistries in the inside of that church and ancient mosaics. And today, when you stand on the terrace, looking out over the Dead Sea, across the Jordan Valley, towards Jerusalem, the wind howls around, and a large bronze cross stands at the edge with a snake wrapped around it. A sign of the salvific power of God offered during Moses' journey in the wilderness and known to Christians through the cross. And it towers over this vista of the promised land. And yet in the midst of that moment, the question in my heart was more prosaic. How did Moses know that that was the promised land? There was nothing to distinguish it. Dusty, dry, as dry as what they'd come from, other than the bit of green, which I don't think you can really see there. That is actually from Mount Nebo. A bit of green right around the Jordan River. Not much different from where they had been in the wilderness. But clearly God has spoken in Moses' heart and said, this is it. Whatever you see with your eyes, whatever misgivings you have, this is where I want my people to find the promises I have given. Moses' commendation to them in this place is telling. It's an exhortation to live in covenant with God, to find blessing by living as God has commanded. 
I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. Looking out on that land of promise, Moses knows that the promise will only be realized if the people choose God and God's ways in that land. Green or desert will not matter. For life is the practice of choosing every day, every minute. We can and do choose death. We can, both legally and literally these days, choose death through medically assisted dying or by simply choosing not to live by inaction, by deliberate choice, by indifference, or by fear. Life is not our default. Our default is simply existence. In the midst of all the pressures around us, battered by every wind, and not just winds of doctrine, but the winds of our social relationships, of peer pressure, of greed, of just frankly survival, the winds of our expectations, the winds of panic as we see around us with the coronavirus or with the winds of a diagnosis of cancer, all of those winds can push us. But life, rich, full, joy-filled in spite of all evidence to the contrary, is defined by our relationship with the Creator rooted and grounded in love that gives us a certain unmovable, unshakable place of security where we find all that we need. Our baptism is a choice to affirm that covenant of love and grace. It may have been made for you as an infant and then raised in the faith, or it may have been made for you as an adult but it is a choice to turn to see the world in a particular way and follow that way because it is the way of life that is discovered in the living of it. Statistics are an objective measure of statistical data. And that data that was reported recently does show us in, frankly, what looks like free fall to death. But they are not the whole story. They are a snapshot of what might happen if nothing changes. The power to change is with us and in us by choosing life. Whether we can yet see the result. It is to choose life in God, in this moment, now. Jesus faced this challenge every day, choosing life over the pressures and winds of others' expectations, choosing to fill each encounter with the love and grace of God as the first principle of every tradition, of every law to discern what was needed, to not accept the expected. Many of us have walked with those who are terminally ill and have walked knowing that they have a choice. Will they choose to live until they die? or stop choosing life and die. And I expect every one of us has been at the bedside of someone who we thought 
would have lived much longer according to the diagnosis and the possibilities. And others who medically looked like they would not survive the night and live. I well remember as a student chaplain while I was in seminary at Women's College Hospital and there were two rooms, one across from the other in a hallway on a cancer ward. And in one room was a woman who had had surgery for stomach cancer and would live. The doctors were clear about that, she would live. But everything about her was bitterness and anger and fear, and no one liked going into her room, let me tell you. <laughs> and across the hall was a woman who everyone knew was close to death with a brain tumor. She was a woman of faith. And her room just lit up with joy when you walked into it. She would look at you and say, how are you? And had a big smile. And you felt that you'd been visited when you went to visit her because she knew where her security was in Christ. And she knew where her home was in God. And she was choosing life every moment, every day. Sometimes we are caught in bigger systems that choose for us. Sometimes family. Sometimes the powers around us don't make it a simple choice. But I think we have more choice than we think. Now I speak to you today as what I've discovered looking around this room, <laughs> a senior cleric. I, I didn't realize I'd gotten that far, but <laughs> um, I well remember coming to these events and uh, often feeling like the junior cleric as I saw all those ahead of me who were much more senior, but I, I'm looking at those who were retired thinking, I know all of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I look back on ministry, I look back in my life, and I know that there are times when I chose what the winds of others were blowing at me. That I chose sometimes fear over what was needed and right in that moment. I know there were times that I did not choose what was life. I had a friend who had a very um, enthusiastic and exuberant way of approaching life. We went for a walk one day in a park, and uh, in the park in this green field, um, there was just a kind of play area, and there were these stilts lying on the ground just for anybody to pick up and try. She said, okay, come on, let's try them. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. There is no way. <laughs> and I regret that to this day. Uh, there was something about, oh, I'm going to look silly, I'm, I'm not going to do this right, I'm going to fall over and be an idiot. Uh, and she said, so? <laughs> she was somebody who always chooses life. And in that moment, I was letting the expectations of others choose for me, and fear choose for me. So when have you stood on the precipice between life and death. When have you faced a time when you had to choose to live? Maybe it was after the end of a relationship. Maybe it was after the death of someone or something or some ministry or some part of your life. 
after betrayal by a friend or a parish? When have you had to choose, as Moses was calling the people of Israel to choose? And what did you choose in that moment? I should have begun by saying what I'm going to do is over the three talks is uh, leave you with some questions at the end just to reflect on. Um, the first and the last talk are probably slightly longer, the second one a little bit shorter. I just invite you in the time in between to sit with the questions or sit with Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 20, which was the first reading of our Eucharist today. You might want to read some of that um, text around 30, 31, 32, and listen to Moses speaking to the people. As he looks at this, this promised land that shows nothing in it of the promise yet. Not even Jerusalem is visible in any way. <laughs> and he invites them to choose life. We gather again at noon. When Moses spoke, And I hope you realize here I am not a Hebrew scripture scholar, so I'm not going to get into the origins of Deuteronomy and all of the rest of it. I'm speaking here primarily devotionally in the way that scripture speaks to us uh, based on the, the stories and the texts. Uh, there's probably long arguments we could have around the origins, etc. However, there is a large church on the top of Mount Nebo <laughs> put there by people for whom this is a place where they hear the story of the life of Moses, of the Exodus, and it speaks about relationship with God in a particular way. And so Moses says to the people, choose life, and it was spoken not only to them individually, but to them corporately, spoken to a people tired of moving, of changing, spoken as he looks out on a land he will not see. Choosing life is hard work. It's much easier to just choose indifference, to let go, to stop. For Moses, he will not see the fullness of the promise made to him and to the people. And frankly, like Moses, we will not share in or see the full results of the work we are doing now. The promised land that we believe we are heading towards, missional, vibrant, healthy parish life that we long for, we will not fully see, because frankly, that is not just the cycle of life now, but it has always been true. In every generation, there is some aspect of life that is dying and something new emerging. Now, I was in parish ministry long enough to know that when you arrive in a new parish, you look around at the context, you look around at what needs to be done, and you think your predecessor was an idiot. 
because you see all sorts of things that need to happen and you wonder why they didn't do it. But of course, by the time you're getting close to the end of your time in that parish, you know how you are going to be perceived by your successor. Because you dealt with the things you were called to deal with in the life of that community at that time. And as you are finishing your time, you can see all sorts of new things that have emerged. And for whatever reason, whatever priorities have been set or needed to be set, you chose to give life in a particular way and your successor will do the same. And so it behooves us to be very gentle with our predecessors. <laughs> be thankful for what they did do, for the things that they took on, for the things that they gave life to. For we will come to the end of our time and hand on our work in an ongoing cycle where the fullness of what we seek is always future. And in the pews in front of you, in the ministry you serve, there are some who have never known a church other than the one they see at this moment. A few will still remember BCP morning prayer and Eucharist alternating, or maybe once a month, and can recite the liturgy by heart and sing Marbeck and remember felt boards and film strip projectors and the ubiquitous AYPA. And if you don't know what that is, be thankful. <laughs> Spent more of my ministry listening to reasons why we need the AYPA back. <laughs> you will also have those that were nurtured in faith by the charismatic movement, renewal movements, cursio. My ministry began in the year the Book of Alternative Services was published. Did you realize that the time between the publication of the Book of Common Prayer in 1959 to 1985 is shorter than between the Book of Alternative Services and now? <laughs> it's kind of sobering. <clears throat> and some remember none of all of that. They know only vague things about being Anglican and are seeking something to ground their lives and give them hope. And all of these are in our pews, each remembering a golden age differently. And our task now is together to choose life, whatever the cost. Moses gives his kind of legacy speech after 40 years of leadership, he wants them to choose well how they will live in the land of promise and hope and points them to the God of creation and the God of their salvation. And that is not a choice they have always made. Those 40 years in the wilderness had many moments at which the people looked back over their shoulder and said, it was better there, wasn't it? <laughs> They were complaining about the food, complaining about the lack of water. And when Moses disappears up the mountain to spend time with God, they quickly wonder if he'll ever come back and maybe they need some alternate gods and create the golden calf. Long for, longing for the flesh pots of Egypt. Moses recounts God's saving grace and tells the story again and adjures them to follow and find their life in the commandments that have been set before them. I set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. Choose life. Take to heart all the words that I am giving in witness against you today. Give them as a command to your children so that they may diligently observe all the words of this law. This is no trifling matter to you, for rather, but rather your very life. Through it, you may live long in the land you are crossing over the Jordan to possess. 
Now, if you read the rest of chapter 32, Moses' song is a tad depressing about the sin of the people. In fact, given what scholars think about the actual writing of Deuteronomy, this probably reflects actually on what had been observed about the people, that despite this opportunity to enter the promised land and live fully in it, they have been fickle. They will find gods other than the God who has called them. Moses knows that from his past experience, but he also looks ahead and knows that there will be times that they choose death. He has lived long and seen much and suffered for the people for their sin and his own because in the midst he gets drawn into their demands. And he will not see the promised land for his own part in not maintaining God's holiness in their midst. And if Moses' song seems a bit harsh, it's certainly rooted in experience. Let me take a small digression here to say that one of the saddest things in my own ministry has been to watch and occasionally see colleagues who get lost, who get lost in the despair, get lost in the cynicism, get lost in the pain, unable to find their way back. I don't know if that will be your experience, but can I plead with you to care for each other in this journey? For none of us is perfect. And any one of us can hit a moment where the pain and the struggle of choosing life becomes too hard and may choose to follow other gods, whether it's the god of alcohol or the god of drugs or the god of some other kind. And the only people who truly understand that journey are you. And so if you see a colleague getting lost, reach out, ask the questions, offer a listening ear, and do not judge. Let others carry you when you are unable to see that path and be one who will carry others when they can't. Moses is very realistic about human nature, but he still proclaims where life is to be found in God. It is to have the faith to hang on to faith in the face of all else. The promise is in sight. What will the people choose? The most painful moment for us is when the people we serve choose death. Choose what is less than life-giving for themselves personally or corporately. Sometimes it's a bit like, remember that story, the frog in the kettle? If you want to kill a frog, you put it into cold water and just heat it up slowly. If you drop a frog into boiling water, it'll just jump out. The idea being that we allow ourselves to just gradually, 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 gradually being drawn into death. May not realize that choices are being made in small actions and attitudes. And as clergy, we walk with communities of people who are given the privilege of choosing life or death. Our polity makes that clear. Clergy, laity, bishops together discern the life of our community. Now, I know that um, <laughs> when bishops turn up in parishes, especially parishes that are struggling, you're here to close us. <laughs> I've heard that many times. 
My answer is no, no, I'm, I can't do that. Or at least not until we get way down the path. But when the bishop comes to visit, the bishop is there to hold up a mirror to say, here's what I'm seeing. What are you seeing about your life? What are you choosing as a community? And there is nothing more painful than watching congregations choose death. I think of a parish that had six points, all relatively close together. A couple of them were quite large churches. Others were very small and rural, and all of them struggling, all of them struggling. And we sat down and had some long conversations about what resources they had, and what they could see, and I invited them to enter into a time of discernment about whether it was possible that if they had fewer buildings and more people in any one building, they might have more energy and life and be able to choose something different. Six months later, at their annual meetings, five of them voted to close. And they didn't have to. They chose death. For whatever reason, whether they had just run out of the energy internally to choose life, just couldn't do another spaghetti supper, thank you. <laughs> and the sixth one, <laughs> said, I, we're not closing. <laughs> we've got a building that's accessible. We've got people. We've got energy. So, Bishop, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> there wasn't a cleric within miles <laughs> for them. But thank goodness our uh, diocesan boundaries are porous. We can share. <laughs> and they are still existing to this day. But there was something profoundly sad about watching five of them had gotten to that point where they couldn't choose life. I can think of another small city parish can only afford a priest one quarter time, so very small, very struggling. I have never seen a church built this way where you cannot see it at all from any street. <laughs> the driveway is off a side street, and it's a long driveway squashed between two houses, and at the end of the driveway, this piece of land opens up, and there's this big church, but not visible. In a depressed part of the city, And uh, a church that everybody around thought should just close. It should just close. It should just close. But it has people in it who have chosen life. Doesn't take many. It takes a few leaders. And have said, we're not going anywhere. And we're going to look around this community and say, what does this community need? And it needed a place for young people. And so they put up, made a food cupboard for the youth that were living either homeless or couch surfing in their community. They reached out and found another church that needed a home and created a space for them. And that church is still, still struggling. Can't say it's made a huge financial difference, but I love the energy whenever I was there. And as I've worked much more closely with indigenous communities in the last four years, and particularly in the national level, and listening to Archbishop Mark MacDonald, very aware that our indigenous peoples, in the midst of death-dealing circumstances, choose life. And listen to the stories of what gospel based discipleship is doing in the midst of indigenous communities.
Choosing life is hard work. It's hard work individually, and it's hard work as a community. And it's not guaranteed. And sometimes we do walk with those who will choose death. And so the questions, when has your community chosen death over life? Or life in spite of every evidence to the contrary? When have you faced the death of something you have poured yourself into and it still has died? And where and how did you find life again? This is the time of the afternoon when everybody starts to settle down after a good lunch and the head starts to nod. I, I, I tried to avoid signing up for classes that began at one o'clock <laughs> because I could look back at my notes and at about two or 2.15, the handwriting just kind of petered off. <laughs> Choose life and keep choosing life, choosing life over death. In a nutshell, that's the whole message of the Hebrew scriptures, choosing life with God. From Adam and Eve to Abraham and Sarah to the Moses to the prophets. And of course, it was also the story of humankind's fickleness. Yes, then no, then disaster, then yes that cycle over and over. And we hear in scripture of people being called, called back to God. We hear in Nehemiah and Ezra of the attempt to come back again to choose life by hearing the reading of the covenant, the holy law, inviting people back into this relationship with God and of the corporate commitment of the community to choose life by living the practices of faith. There would be some of the kings that would choose life, like Josiah, but his sons would then choose death. And of course, the same choosing life was the message of John the Baptist and, of course, of Jesus. That no death was stronger than God's love, so keep coming back, keep choosing. And Jesus modeled a life of choosing God first, even when it led into physical death, trusting God into the abyss and trusting that nothing is stronger than that love of God that can and will bring life even out of that death. So what helps us choose well? Well, first, it's to ask where are we looking for our hope? In the gospel we heard at the Eucharist in Mark 8, in the face of having no bread, the disciples interpret everything through the lens of scarcity. Even though Jesus' warning was clearly a metaphorical warning about the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod, Jesus reminds them at each opportunity when there seemed to be not enough that there was an abundance. There is an abundance. The problem was not availability. The problem was perspective. Where are you looking? Are you looking only at the physical material in this moment? 
Or are you looking through the lens of a God who has provided and will provide? I was reminded of this last November when I was invited to be with the Diocese of Quebec for its synod. That was the first synod they'd had in four years. The Diocese of Quebec is largely rural. Uh, some of it is indigenous in the northern part of it. Uh, some of it is in uh, a few larger centers and cities in the heart of French Canada, a province that's not exactly sympathetic to religious views, a very secularized province, and a diocese that was facing scarcity on many levels. And over the last 10 years, they have chosen to see through the eyes of God what is possible. They had redesigned their synod so that not every parish is represented at Synod. They are represented by deanery. The deanery elects clergy and lay representatives from their deanery. And so their Synod had gone from being 100 people gathered to 40 people gathered. And this was the first Synod since that change had been passed four years ago where they had gathered like this. And there was a the bishop had a tad bit of nervousness about what this was going to be like. But there was a sense of hope, a sense of joy, a sense of having turned a corner. There was also a sense, as I listened to some of the groups of people talking about their ministries in areas of the province where they don't have clergy all the time, where in some cases they've given up their buildings, where they're gathering in homes for Eucharist and gathering together when they can, where Montreal Diocesan College has set up some uh, video conference or webinar kinds of learning that looks at the lectionary and says, what would lay readers and lay leaders need in order to lead worship in a small cluster of people in order to interpret the scriptures for this series of Sundays. And so this year being the year of Matthew, Montreal Dio has been doing some online learning with Matthew, where there's a presentation and questions and an opportunity to gather locally. And I was struck by the sense of energy and hopefulness in a diocese that 10 years ago was feeling very, very heavy and weary and wondered if it had a future. It does not mean the future is secure, there's still issues and concerns, but it was a wonderful opportunity to see a diocese that said, we believe that God is still in our midst and that our call is to be faithful. When I look with the lens of the world, it's easy to see we are dying. <laughs> We're fairly irrelevant to most people. <clears throat> In an increasingly secularized world, panic can set in alongside the grief of what we have lost. I'm a boomer. I grew up in some of those large Sunday schools. Although, <laughs> a small aside, last summer at General Synod, we were in Vancouver. I grew up partly in Vancouver and I was confirmed in Vancouver. And so on the Sunday after the primatial election, we had been asked where we wanted to go to church. And even before the election, I said, I'd like to go to St. Philip's because that's where I was confirmed and I'd like to be back in that parish. Whatever happened with the election, I wanted to be back in that parish. I did not particularly recognize the church at all because it had been reformed and shaped and you know, furniture moved and altar brought out and all those things. But we went into the hall that I had remembered as being very large. <laughs> and I remembered having been in an older Sunday school class that met upstairs in a loft area that looked down over this very large hall. And I walked into this fairly small hall <laughs> and looked around and thought, what happened to the loft? <laughs> And I looked up and I could see where it looked like something had been filled in and it was all uh, painted in one color now. And I said to one of the older people, I said, didn't there used to be a loft up there? And they said, oh yeah, that's the youth room now. And I said, well, I remember having Sunday school up there. But my memory of this huge Sunday school was colored by the size I was at the time, I'm sure. <laughs> 
this, so maybe all the boomers are just misremembering the size of the Sunday schools. <laughs> but I do know that when I look through the lens of the world, yeah, it looks scary. It can feel like we're dying, and that's all there is. But when I look through the lens of Christ, I see those pockets of love and grace, those moments of living faith, of creativity, of commitment. And I know that there's more. I see the imperfections of the church, but know it is in God's hands too. And that over the centuries, the God has brought the church through other times of disaster, failure, shrinkage, and decline. Early in my ministry, I was asked whether I thought the Anglican Church of Canada would survive in the midst of whatever fight we were in at that moment. I don't remember which one it was, whether it was the prayer book wars or the sexuality conversations, I don't know. And I said, I, I realize I do not know the answer to that question, but I am absolutely clear that God will have a church in the world. And the question for us is, will we be part of it? Will we put God first and be willing to let go of all else? My ability to choose life is governed by the way in which I see life and where I see it coming from. So what does choosing life look like to you? And what does it ask of you? The image that came to my mind was that of Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by the water, streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. And it was that image of a tree planted by streams of water. Recently, presiding Bishop Michael Curry at the Martin Luther King Day breakfast spoke about a tree by a stream putting down its roots deep. And he said this, if you want to navigate in moral ambiguity and complexity, when lies are substituted for truth, when misbehavior is exalted as just plain behavior, when people are treated like animals and put down, when mamas are separated from their children at the border of this country, you want to navigate that, you've got to be like that tree. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Mother Teresa, any of the saints put down their roots deep in God in the face of all else. In the practices of their faith, in the daily living that roots and grounds who we are. Those who have exemplified Christ-like living in spite of all evidence to the contrary were people of rich practices in their faith. And there's nothing new here, nothing new. It is to be a people of faith in God through Jesus Christ is to be formed to know the world through the eyes of God and live accordingly. It is to practice the faith and to root those practices over and over again, for we drift. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you because I'd have to embarrass myself about the fact that those of us who are clergy are called to recite the daily office every day, morning and night. 
Now this says more about me than you, but it doesn't always happen. I try to have some time of prayer every day, but I know how easy it is to get distracted by the thing you're worried about in the parish, by the upcoming vestry meeting or the one just passed. There's so many things that will distract us. And so we come back to those practices of faith. And there's just four that I want to mention briefly. And the first one is being rooted in scripture. It contains all things necessary for our salvation. Those lovely words that ring in our hearts as Anglicans, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. And that's more than just quickly scanning over them. That's sitting with them, with the stories of our faith, particularly the Gospels, and letting the life of Christ speak in us. Probably one of the most profound times in my own formation was having done the Ignatian spiritual exercises on a Sabbath leave one year of literally praying five times a day through the life of Christ, in which the life of Christ and your life are brought together in prayer, and you are radically changed. You don't have to take a Sabbath leave and do it all at once, but you do need to be rooted in Scripture. The House of Bishops spends time in Bible study every morning when we meet. In the last few years, we've been using gospel-based discipleship that comes out of the indigenous communities. Does not require exegetical excellence or scholastic achievement. It requires you to sit and let the scriptures speak to your heart and allow yourself to speak with your colleagues about what you hear. Because scripture is about the truth of God in relationship with human beings across centuries. And it is true, it is true in their lives, it is true in our lives. And we need to read and read again and read again in a different time of our lives and read the same passage again in another time of our lives and hear it speak again. We need to be grounded in prayer. We see Jesus constantly taking time from what seem to be pressing matters. I mean, would you walk away from a whole lineup of people who want to be healed when you have the power to heal? And he says, I need to be in prayer. We see Jesus when he's hard pressed to act, praying, we see Jesus at Gethsemane, facing the winds of power against him. We see the Jerusalem leadership gather in prayer to solve issues in their community, whether it's who to replace Judas or whether it's in Acts 15 as they wrestle with what does it mean to welcome Gentiles in our midst. We see it in James, if you were sick, call the elders and gather in prayer. And if the form of prayer that you have been using is no longer connecting you to that life-giving spirit of Christ, seek another. Our history has many forms and styles and ways of praying <clears throat> to meet your particular personality, depending on whether you're an ISTJ, an ENFP. <laughs> the mystics, the monastics, the religious all know that there are many forms of prayer that speak into the heart. 
So whether it's contemplative or apophatic or Ignatian or extemporaneous or simply silence or meditation, whether it's morning and evening prayer out of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, whether it's Franciscan prayer, the only thing not to do is to stop praying. And the third practice is to be engaged in community. Now, I know that for every one of us, we've had that person who said, I can meet Jesus on the golf course. <laughs> Some of you are nodding. <laughs> that is true. I am someone who finds the presence of God in nature, but I also know that I must be engaged in community. It is the crucible of community life as God's people. It is there that we learn and grow and practice this life of faith. It's the place of our greatest joy and our greatest pain. It is the place where the edges get rubbed off us as we discover that the world doesn't center around me and that I have to pay attention to the life and the pain and the joys and the needs of others. It is in relationships with others that we discover our own assumptions, our weaknesses, our strengths, our needs. It is engaging with differences that we remember the God-given, what Rabbi Jonathan Sachs calls the dignity of difference. That we are reminded we do not own the whole in ourselves. It is where we practice giving and receiving. And Jesus chose 12. And Paul, St. Paul writes to the early churches about the nature of community, its costs and its call. And we are called to live in and to offer leadership to and with communities of Christians seeking to live out that relationship with God. And lastly, it is to be shaped by the love of Christ. I love, uh, uh, I think it's Michelangelo who said this, that when he saw a block of marble or stone and began to sculpt, he was not creating something he was releasing what was already there in the stone, the living, breathing beauty that was there within the marble. And I've often thought that that is what God is doing with us, releasing what is the beauty that God sees already in us that has been hidden by the things that have stuck onto us from other aspects of life. It was during that Ignatian retreat that I had a profound sense that God was longing to do that for me, release the fullness of the person he sees inside, inside all the self-imposed or otherly imposed constraints of expectations and assumptions of what I could not be, to release the beauty and humanity of the person I am called to be by choosing life in Christ. Whenever I find myself struggling with decisions embedded in difficulties, I look up and have to choose again. Choose to find my life not in my ability to solve problems or to think my way through them, but to put down my roots once again more deeply in scripture, in prayer, in silence, in listening, in God's way. And finding the knots untied and difficulty sorted, not because they are easier, but because the priorities are clearer. And my own blockages or assumptions or sin are seen for what they are. When some heard Jesus' words in John 6, about where to find life. 
Some said, oh, that's too hard, and walked away. And Jesus looks at the disciples and said, will you go as well? And they say, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. I think I missed a slide. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. From Jeremiah 17, 8. The ultimate sign of rooting in God is in the cross. And on Mount Nebo is this wonderful sculpture of the cross with a snake wrapped around it. It combines Moses' call to look on the bronze serpent for healing and the ultimate sign of God's infinite love, willing to save all by entering even into death. In this time of decline and transformation in every sphere of life, can we choose life in God in spite of everything people are saying? Can we practice our faith daily and joyfully look for the signs, however small, however tentative, that God is here in our midst? Yeast, salt. In my ministry, I've had the uh, the great joy of uh, dedicating one church, <laughs> I have deconsecrated many others. And I've grieved with the families that have founded them that were still there. I've sought to nurture new forms of ministry that beef- briefly burned bright and then spluttered out. Worked hard with communities to form new regional models of ministry, only to see them choose to die rather than to live. I've had to look within myself to see where I have made assumptions and built on expectations that were damaging. And allowed my intense desire for those communities to choose life, to consume even my own soul, and having to back up and let go. I've had to choose life in God again and again, and God is always there, ready to pour out healing and hope, to renew my soul, to open my eyes, and to help me to see there is life here even when it doesn't look like what I expected, or what I wanted, or what I thought was the right way. We've all heard over the last few months of the terrible fires in Australia, consuming huge, huge, vast areas of burnt uh, scrub and outback. But even within a couple of weeks of that, some images of new life sprouting out of the burned out ground. That life, the seeds of life, some of which are only released when a fire tears through an area are still there, a gift of the Creator to constantly renew. And so we do not have to be afraid, for this is God's world, it's not ours. This is God's church, it does not belong to us. And that if we will choose life in God, and be faithful, and patient, and persevere, 
that no matter what the statistics say, we will be here after 2040. I'm going to be here, at least I hope. <laughs> and I think some of you will. And we will be still calling out faithfully the God who created us, loves us, redeems us, sanctifies us, and calls us to share good news. Rooted in scripture, grounded in prayer, engaged in community, and allowing ourselves to be shaped by the love of Christ. Many of us will not see that promised land of full renewal of the church in our time, and maybe, maybe, who knows how long away it is. But we will and can see hopeful signs, spurts of growth, indications of direction. We can see those people in whom the light of Christ suddenly is lit and who run with it. going to conclude with a colic that was just sent to me yesterday by Sister Helen Clare. It was the colic, the alternate colic used on Epiphany Sunday, Epiphany 6a. Divine gardener, you give growth to our seeds and raise to abundant life that which seems dead. Teach us to choose blessing and life so that we may walk blamelessly, seeking you through reconciliation with all your children. Amen. Amen. Might you have any questions for Archbishop Linda? Yes, Daniel. Um, one of the things you asked, the questions you asked is where are you looking? You know, the, the difference between um, availability and perspective. So I'm just wondering where, where are you seeing new life in the church? You know, with all the talk of decline, where do you see God bringing new life? Yeah, around the church, I'm hearing stories of new life, of what I would call the, we're calling the green shoots as we get ready for the next Council of General Synod. Um, places where people are searching for God and still looking to, even to institutions like ours that have deep roots in history and tradition because there's something there. So, um, you know, I think of being in the chapel at Renison College with uh, Megan Collings Moore, who's the chaplain there, who has a wonderful and marvelous ministry with university students. It's vibrant and lively, and they, they still come back after they've left the college because that's the place that they can find a place to ask questions and engage, uh, and yet still have the rooting of Eucharist and prayer. I see people choosing um, forms of morning prayer. <clears throat> I see it across the church, not just within the Anglican church, but I see other churches that previously would have eschewed any of the forms of tradition that we have carried, um, bringing them into their own life in a different way, but, you know, still there. So I, I certainly see that. Um, uh, Bishop Susan Bell was telling me the other day about um, a community in Hamilton, an old church that was just being used for storing pews. And they had a rectory beside it that was in pretty bad shape, and uh, she had someone come who said, I'd really like to start a small kind of new monastic kind of community, and could, you know, might you have a place that we might consider doing this? And so they're starting that, and, and when she went to visit, discovered they were doing evening prayer or compline in the church. And, you know, looking for that. So I see places and, and, you know, things emerging where people are trying new things. Some of those will not succeed. 
necessarily, because they still have to live in this world and they have to contend with needing a building or needing some space or needing some resources, and not all of those will be available. But I think the more we do that, the more we begin to be open to what else might be possible. So I think they're there. I also see it in individuals and in people who catch the spark. I see it in people who are deeply engaged with their community, who pay attention to the people around them. Um, whether they're people in need or whether they're uh, just wanting to be part of the voice of that community in claiming wholeness and health for that community. Um, so I, I do see them. They're small, but they're there. Others? Sure. sure. Good afternoon, Art It's so wonderful to have you here with us. A couple, at least twice, probably more times, you mentioned gospel-based discipleship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you're right. It, that's a particular term for a, a small um, um, book and a way of doing a very modified morning prayer uh, and includes the opportunity to go around the circle where each person is invited to reflect, first of all, on a word that, that captures them in the gospel and then what is Jesus saying to you through that gospel? And then what is Jesus calling you to do through that gospel? And so it's very much, it's a devotionally rooted way of engaging with the gospel, but it, it moves past all of our, our kind of intellectual attempts to prove our, I'm better than you because I get this. Um, and, uh, and it's proved, I think, it's certainly proved in our House of Bishops and in, in indigenous communities that I hear are using this regularly as their primary um, way of engaging the gospel has been life-giving for them. So it's a particular way, uh, and uh, the gospel-based discipleship order is online at anglican.ca. You can, you can download it, you can use it, you can see it. Yeah. Connie. In a congregation, you have Oh, as you know, who choose life and who choose death. And as a leader of the congregation, you want to uphold all the people, be they choosing life or death. As a national leader, what advice would you have to those of us who are ministering at the local level to help navigate that tension between those choosing life and those choosing death? I think we, we always have to ask ourselves, have we defined what choosing life looks like? Um, so be a little cautious about that. Have we defined, it looks like you being in those pews every Sunday and going to the Bible study, and, you know, um, we've already defined what that looks like. So I think we have to be uh, aware of our assumptions there. Um, but yeah, some people just have worn out and are unable to imagine anything other than what they've had. And at that point, I think we have to be really clear that we were probably part of the problem. We probably nurtured that in them, that church looks like this and only this. And so they cannot, like I can remember um, having a small group in a, um, another room and saying, well, we can have the Eucharist right here. We can. You know, it was, a, it was a shock that you could sit in a circle around a table and, and invite them to serve one another with the Eucharist, and that was just radical. Now, that was a while ago. I hope that's not quite as true today, but I think we, we sometimes have nurtured in people an expectation that church only looks like wooden pews in a row. Uh, so if we can awaken the imagination to something other that is still faithful, but sometimes people can't imagine that. And sometimes it's because so many other things are tied to that way of being church. Um, one of the discoveries I made in moving to the Diocese of Huron was that the people who'd founded these churches were still there. <laughs> so their entire family history is rooted in that church. And my goodness, if you tell them that it's time to let go of that building, they will fight you to that nail, <laughs> to the end. <laughs> Uh, they will probably win. <laughs> uh, not, not completely, but I, um, 
but at that point, I, I, you know, you do need to let go and say, okay, um, if you can maintain sort of a, a, you know, whatever is feasible, and let them walk until that point where they literally cannot, uh, you do have to love them. Well, you you know, there's that book, Never Call Them Jerks. There's a reason that somebody had to write that title. It's because we think that people who disagree with us are somehow, well, you, you know, you're not thinking enough theologically. But maybe there are other issues at heart for them. The losses are too great and too deep. And the energy, and I have to say, we've got lots of churches with very elderly congregations. And the thought of re-engaging in a totally new way that they haven't thought of before is just too much. And at that point, I would say, then our call is to palliative care. It's to love them into that place where they can let go with grace and be sure they're accompanied in whatever way they need going forward. Um, it's painful, hard, difficult work. And it requires us to honor them and honor the ministry that they've given for years and years and years and not make them feel like failures because at this point they couldn't imagine something new. It's to say, okay, then let's find a way to walk this gently. It's not always easy because, you know, there are finances involved and uh, debt and all those other things that, that are pressures on us. Um, but they need to know that you love them no matter what choice they make. Whether they choose to live or whether they choose to die. And that God loves them. Whatever they, choice they make. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard. It's very hard. Peter, yeah. I think you had a question. We, we do preach and, and say that um, death does not have the final word. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm really grateful for your offering of choosing that. But how might we also encourage you choosing death in order to live? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is what many of our parties are struggling with. And so dying isn't a problem if you're going to live into something that is life given. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how can we speak to that mm -hmm. as very much yeah, I think that part of that is, is the whole conversation about um, if this way of being is not able to live, what is the legacy that you can share with others and enter into that legacy in some way? Um, you know, most often that, that involves having to leave a building in order to find new life in a new way. And some of the conversations I've had have been around, well, what, what is it that you need to take with you? I mean, I, I, I am quite surprised sometimes when under our polity, if parishes amalgamate, they can take their assets with them and suddenly they've got something to bring. They've got a gift to bring. They've got something new to bring and give life. And still have congregations say, nope, not gonna do that. <laughs> Um, now, in the end, that life just ends up back with the diocesan office, which is also not where they wanted it to go. <laughs> um, I, I think it's reframing it to say that our job is not simply that what is the church for? It's not simply for maintaining this way of being. It's for carrying the life of Jesus Christ with us into the community and into the world. And how could we do that in a new way? And I think that's one of the reasons we're struggling so much these days is that, that we have to deepen the discipleship of people in the nature of being a disciple of Jesus Christ that has nothing to do with any particular building. Now, sometimes if you're working with a congregation where people have never moved from that community, have never worshiped in any place other than that building, that is very hard. Uh, you know, I'm deeply grateful that <laughs> um, my parents moved around the country and so we worshiped in all sorts of places and um, my life has taken me into places where I've worshiped with different communities, different denominations, different countries, and have seen ways of feeling the presence of Christ and God in the midst of our community 
in, in very different ways. So I, I do think we, we bear some of the responsibility for discipleship that needs to happen around that. Yeah. I think. Uh, on the same, same idea, a comment. Just uh, I was thinking as you were speaking that Jesus left the tomb and went to the garden. And that is a very powerful image. Mm. You know, I want to see Yeah. Kathy? Yeah. Um, over the years, the church has gone through a number of uh, changes, uh, different things have happened. The one that I remember the most was when we brought in uh, shared ministry back in the 60s. That was a very controversial, it was considered very cutting edge, lots of battles uh, to get that happen. And of course, that's just what we do now all the time. In your journey across the nation, have I think for me what is most important is not, you know, what is the cutting edge in X that we all need to pay attention to. What's most important is listening to the context you're in. Because what's working in Kelowna is not going to work in downtown Toronto. And what's working in Huron, I promise you, would not work in Toronto, and vice versa. I learned. <laughs> It took me three years to get over saying the diocese of Ta <laughs> Just as I finished there, I was saying the diocese of <laughs> um, but But, I, but I, I mean that seriously, that, that context, where God has placed you and called you with those people in that community, in this political time, in this economic time, in the needs of this community now here, where is God? And that's hard of, you know, I, I think that when I was in seminary, there was just beginning to be that work on doing the social analysis, doing some of that work. I think that's really important work. Um, and, uh, and asking, and obviously looking and listening to what's happening in other places, yes, but not to clone it, not to make it into the fix for my place, because it won't be. Not unless you are a clone of that particular community and that particular priest or that particular leader with those particular gifts. I think looking at the gifts that are in your midst and in you. And what is it that God has called you to do in this place? Um, and, and that takes a lot of listening and discernment and prayer and work to, to do that. What are some of the things I see? I mean, it's really exciting to hear about St. Jack's in Montreal that has the trapeze artists swinging from the ceiling and think, okay, <laughs> that's not going to work everywhere. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, uh, great to think of, um, uh, you know, a place that has, I can think of a place in London that has a, a Eucharist on the bog every Friday morning at 7 a.m. and gets a number of people coming out to stand in the cold and have Eucharist in the midst of God's nature. Well, the bog is right next to the church, so everybody knows it. Uh, you know, it works for them. Um, the, other thing, the, the other thing at the heart of it all is that what people are looking for most, I believe, is authenticity about the faith that is within you. They don't want to be told the party line of, you know, you know, the gospel in four easy sentences. They want to know what you believe and why you believe it and what difference it makes in your life. And they want to hear that in a way that, that includes the vulnerability about, yeah, there's some things I don't know, some things I don't get. There's some things I struggle with. There's some things that I'm still learning. Um, they want to hear your story. Um, and not, not, it's not all about us. It's not all about me. It's, but they want to hear the story told through the lives of people for whom it's meaningful. And we've, I think, usually felt, well, when I was learning homiletics, you never used I in a sermon. You were told that was completely verboten. You, it was not about you, you were never supposed to use I, you weren't supposed to talk about yourself. That's completely shifted. People, now they'll also look at you and say, yeah, but you're paid to say that. So that what they really want to hear is they want to hear it from other people in the congregation. 
They want to hear it from other people around them, that it matters and it makes a difference. And so how do we enliven and encourage others to tell their story of faith, which will be heard much more powerfully than mine or any of us who wear a collar. Uh, and and that, that's what we need to nurture, I think, most. Yeah. Elena Rose, you had a question. Yeah. Um, it's more like a, a comment and a, and a question together, and that is, uh, I heard you say uh, the whole idea of not going into places and making assumptions, and, and, and actually being there, and being in relationship, and developing relationships. Uh, when I went to St. Peter's and discovered that the majority of the congregants were 90, in their 90s, and had started the congregation, and it's easy to take your assumptions in there thinking that it's going to be, their voice is going to be the standard thing. They're going to say they're too tired, they're, they're not going to want to change, and they're going to resist amalgamation. No, um, it, it's been remarkable that um, if you can step aside from the assumption mm -hmm. is that sometimes those older 90 year olds who have only been in one church all their lives have an incredible way of connecting to the story and that can still be lifted up and give life to people around them and it's and I heard you uh, say that, but sometimes we get caught in the assumptions of thinking that elderly parishes, they may not be able to do the same things, like the fundraisers and the uh, whatever, but they can be amazing. And, uh, and I just appreciate that that's your stance. And I think we, I just want you to say that as really strongly keep saying that because so we don't get caught in our assumptions thinking older congregations are just going to want to shuffle off uh, when we might discover something. Well, some will, but, but some may surprise us. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I, yeah, sometimes people surprise us completely with what they are prepared to do and how radical they are prepared to be. We're the ones that aren't as radical as they are sometimes. <laughs> yes. In choosing life or death, or yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes it's it's chosen for you by circumstances. Um, yeah, I can think of one time in my ministry that that was extremely painful, extremely painful, and it forced me to have to let go of a whole way of being in leadership that I had to re-examine because I'd allowed myself to get sucked into uh, expectations, some of which I placed on myself, some of them were placed on me by others, but I had then become part of the problem, and it was not life-giving for me or for others. And so that was, yeah, it was hard, very hard, um, being kind of drawn into that, um, a kind of a death, but it was a death that needed to happen in order for me to find a new way of being. Um, choosing life, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't want to say that God's way is always to choose the church way. So, um, you know, right at the beginning, uh, I, I trained as a music teacher. And uh, when I was coming to the end of my university time, um, I had kind of two things that were on the plate. One was an opportunity to teach in India that had come through a, an InterVarsity Christian Fellowship colleague of mine. And I'd made this application to this school and I had no idea whether that was gonna come up. The same time, music has always been a really important part of my life and I had um, uh, done an audition for Jeunesse Musicale, which uh, runs a major, almost professional kind of music program in Quebec in the summer. And on the same day, 
I got a letter from Jeunesse Musicale offering me a full scholarship, and I got a telegram from the school offering me a job at the school. What are you going to choose? <laughs> and uh, at that moment, it was not, there was no question in my mind, because I had a deep sense of call to teach. And that this call to go to India was somehow something profound from God. I, I can't explain it, I just had that sense at the time. And, um, and I chose that, and it's been an amazing journey since then. I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, so was it life-giving? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, there were, there were lots of learning in that. But it was, it was choosing what I felt God was calling me to. And so, what if I'd chosen the other? Would I be playing flute in an orchestra somewhere? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, so those are two examples, one of, that drew me into a kind of death, one that drew me into life, yeah. Don, and then Sherman, and we'll close it off. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Um, the word that I, I received as I listened to your, uh, to your addresses today is that Jesus started and small church has always been where I've been. It's what I know. It's what I love. And I, I still have a strong sense that God is doing something amongst us to learn how to be smaller. And that gives me delight. I don't know if it might not bring a lot of people to light. It brings me some delight because um, I think there's real gifts there. But one of the challenges of a smaller church um, is that leadership will change. And I wonder um, if you have any, uh, any thoughts on the future of uh, clergy and bishops in a church that, and I emphasize, my emphasis is intentional, a church that is growing smaller. Yeah, uh, during my time in Huron, I, I, I talked a lot about bivocational clergy uh, because our presumption of a, a full stipendary clergy in the way that we have developed uh, is not going to be sustainable for everybody. Uh, may well be sustainable for larger congregations in urban centers, but most of the rural areas are not going to be able to do that. It just doesn't look possible at this point. Um, and, uh, and so what will it look like to have bivocational clergy? It'll change so many things about how we do stuff because you can't assume that people are free to come to something like this all the time. Um, bivocational clergy, you have to be careful that they're not being overworked in both jobs. <laughs> um, you also have to not presume that they're available to take on all the committee work that, that we presume. I mean, there's gonna be lots of changes that go with that. Um, uh, but I think it'll bring a richness in having clergy who are also still deeply rooted in secular life. One of the things I noticed after, after 19 and a half years in parish ministry, I went to work at the National Church Office and had to ride the subway at the same time as the rest of the world, and I went, oh, <laughs> this is what life is like. <laughs> I had to sign a mortgage and go, <laughs> mortgage rates meant a lot more to me then. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the, that sense of being kind of let out of a kind of an ivory tower where it was wonderful. I was at the heart of parish life and I was constantly planning and working and doing all sorts of things. But it was not as connected as I think bivocational clergy would be with the, the needs and concerns of the people we're serving. So I think there's something around bivocationality that, that we're going to have to wrestle with. Um, there are many dioceses where bishops also serve as clergy in, dio in parishes. Uh, in the Yukon, that's been true for some time. Um, that, may be, that may happen in some dioceses. Uh, small, intentional community developed in congregations. Will they be in church buildings? Not likely. Um, certainly most of the church buildings I know were built over 100 years ago with materials that were meant to last 100 years. And now we're wondering why they're so expensive to fix. <laughs> uh, says she whose cathedral was going like this at one point. <laughs> um, 
So, so there are lots of things that I think we'll need to change. And I think we need to change. One of the things I became aware of in the 1990s was that Anglicans had a disproportionate sense of our own importance in the community. We have a sense that we were, we've been in power. I mean, we were literally in power in the 19th century, but we hadn't lost that yet, even though we weren't any longer. And we're going to have to get used to being a minority, to being small, to not having any power unless we partner with others around um, uh, issues where we share common values and common concern. And so all of that is a, is a shift in identity that we've not fully made yet and that still lies before us more and more and more. So th those are just a few thoughts about what I think is coming. Thank you. Yeah. And Chairman. Sure. Um, as, as you were talking about uh, choosing life, choosing death, and the lostness of some folks, uh, I flashed on a, an old uh, saying of Harvey Cox, uh, not to decide is to decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, choosing sounds like a very active verb, right? Mm -hmm. And yet lots of choices get made by people simply not deciding to do anything. Sort of an apathy or whatever, but um, you you mentioned the familiar you know lostness like alcohol and drugs and other things, and what came to me in that moment another kind of lostness that sometimes doesn't get named is a kind of depression <laughs> that settles in and it's not necessarily clinical it doesn't necessarily require um, uh, antidepressant drugs, but the net effect is that someone is sort of immobilized professionally to do something because they, everything they've tried hasn't worked, as it were. And so choosing life, they, they don't know what choosing life would look like in the midst of that scenario. Um, so I just, I just, it's sort of an observation, I guess, on, on this. Was it, was it Barbara Brown Taylor? Did she write the book uh, on We? Uh, there was a... Acedia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. I think not to choose is to choose. And sometimes we are immobilized by, by fear, by, by depression, by despair. Um, yeah. And that's, that's why we need community. Because I think community carries us in our darkest time. And that dark time can go on for a long time. Uh, and... I think that's where we need others to be hope and to be faith for us. And it's particularly devastating if you're the faith leader in a community, because who can you tell? Who can you talk to about that? And so if we're not um, spending time supporting one another, paying attention, and allowing space for people to simply be who they are in that moment, um, I think we're, we're doing a disservice, but you're right, it's, it's, it's not easy, and it's not clear that everybody will find their way out of that, other than to say that our call is still to love them and welcome and embrace and keep, keep the door and the hand open for them uh, in that, yeah. Great, thank you. I wonder uh, Bishop Jenny would come up and say a few words, please. I could show him my bag. <laughs> <laughs> you can be my Vanna White. Thank you. Yeah. Archbishop Linda, it's really been wonderful uh, to have you with us uh, today. Now, we all know that a prophet is without honor in her hometown. And yet today, we honor you here in your home diocese. Mark Twain. Mark Twain said that there are two kinds of speakers, those who were nervous and the liars. <laughs> and if you were nervous in front of the hometown crowd, uh, you certainly didn't show it today. You helped us face some of our fears as clergy, uh, mindful of the decline in the church, as well as the new life and innovation. Uh, you've strengthened us, you've exhorted us uh, to deeply root ourselves in Christ, both our personal identity, uh, as well as our hope, so that we can choose life again and again 
and again. Uh, You brought us back to those four spiritual practices that we all know, but I know I need to be reminded of each day. Uh, Scripture, prayer and all its variety, uh, being engaged in community, and above all else, being shaped by the love of Christ. And choosing life is hard work, and you gave us food for the labor, so thank you. Now, we know that one of the ways that you choose life is by uh, keeping your Sabbath, both each week. I hope that hasn't changed, has it, Archbishop? (laughs) Mostly. Uh, But also in the summer, Archbishop Linda takes uh, an annual canoe trip uh, with friends. So as a, a small token of our appreciation for your ministry with us today, we have gotten you a gift certificate from Mountain Equipment Co-op. 